Welcome to the Thinking Practitioner Podcast, a podcast where we dig into the fascinating issues, conditions, and quandaries in the massage and manual therapy world today. I'm Whitney Lowe. And I'm Till Luca. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Thinking, Thinking Practitioner. Practitioner. Hi, I'm Till Luca. ABNP is proud to sponsor the Thinking Practitioner Podcast. ABNP membership gives massage therapists and body workers exceptional liability insurance numerous discounts and great resources to help you thrive like their abmp podcast available at abmp.com slash podcasts or wherever you listen and i'm whitney Lowe. and even if you're not a member you can get free access to massage and bodywork magazine where till and i are frequent contributors and special offers for thinking practitioner listeners at abmp.com forward slash thinking so till how are you today I am doing very well. I got to teach one of my first in-person classes over the weekend, and it was just delightful. I saw that you were uh, up in my neck of the woods up here in Oregon. That's right. It yeah. was right there in Portland, and we actually live streamed it as we taught it, which was a new experiment. But it, besides having to juggle three things at once, it went, went really great. Cool. All right. Very good. How about you? How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm kind of out of the woods. I've been ill for a little while and uh, back into the uh, land of the healthy once again. So feeling right. good today and looking forward to our conversation. We have a wonderful guest with us today. Uh, who is that that's joining us today? I am excited about our guest. Dr. Antonio Stecco is our guest. And let me introduce you, Dr. Stecco, before I check in with you. You are assistant professor at Rusk Rehabilitation, New York University. You're a physiatrist, the president of the Fascial Manipulation Association since 2010, assistant to the president of the International Society of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, the ISPRM, from 2012 to 2014, president of the International Mild Pain Society since 2020, and your scientific activity is devoted to studying the human fascia, or fasciae, multiple, from macroscopic, histological, and pathophysiological points of view. You have performed over 100 cadaver resections for personal for research purposes, and since 27, 2007, you've taught theoretical and practical courses about the fascial manipulation method on five continents. You're the author of more than 40 papers about the fasciae, a co-author of five books and a co-author for multiple chapters of international text published by the respected publisher Elsevier, whom our uh, one of our sponsors for today's show, Handspring, it consists of people that formerly worked with Elsevier and are now running Handspring Publishing. So welcome, Dr. Stecco. Well, thanks for the invitation. Really a pleasure to be here and uh, great to have the possibility to talk about fascia. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, you. You are someone that I've been wanting to talk to for years. So I'm really glad that you made the time to join us from Italy, where you are now. I first got exposed to your work when I was reading a newsletter from Budiman Manansi from Australia, the Terra Rosa newsletter, where he interviewed you and uh, put in, I think, a diagram or two. But you were very precisely describing the layers in fascia in the body and the fascial you know superficial fascia the gliding layers that exist between the different layers of fascia and it was an insight to me because having worked with uh, fascia and the body for many years to hear it described in that way and hear it described so precisely i actually took a hold of my own arm while i'm reading your interview and going oh my god he's right feel that that is so, that's awesome so it was it was a exciting moment for me to get that kind of precision and clarity and since then, I've learned that you've done quite a bit of research, like your bio says, on the actual anatomy and structure and location of the different fascial structures in the body, as well as some really interesting research on uh, some of the mechanisms behind the properties of fascia itself. So I'm very pleased to have you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I was always, I mean, uh, waiting to, you know, introduce a little bit more of this material, and I mean, it's my pleasure to have the possibility to, you know, give uh, my contribution to whoever want to know a little bit more about this tissue. Well, I'm, I'm in that group, in spite of having uh, worked with it for many years. I'm in that group of people that wants to know more, and I have learned a bunch from your research and your writings and your presentations at uh, some of the conferences I've been to. But could you give us a little more background, if you're willing, just what else would be interesting for our listeners to know about you? How did you get interested in this line of work? That kind of thing. Well, 
honestly, I'm the third one of the family because my father was like the first physiotherapist in Italy long time ago. So he was able to make research, like a hands-on research, how, you know, applied force in the tissue can change it. Then he started to do like a dissection in animal first and then in human. And that helped to understand what is the rule of fascia in the body. And on top of that, I have my sister that is an associate professor in the Department of Anatomy. She's an orthopedic surgeon and she's dedicated to research the biomechanical rule of fascia in our body. So I'm the third one. That, that is why they say like the, the Steco family, you know, is uh, the one is bring over the research in fascia because uh, we are, but there's a big group on the side of us that are helping us to do research. And I'm talking about the NYU, I'm talking about uh, other group uh, worldwide that are helping us. What, what, what timeline more or less was your father doing that, his initial research? You mentioned animal and different kinds of uh, research into fascia. When was that going on? I mean, it's more than 40 years ago. Uh, let's say that the first book that my father published was in 1987. That is the first book. And since then, uh, he has published more than 15 books about uh, different language. I mean, it's like an eight book that were translated then in, in different other language with a new edition. But, you know, there's a long way from there to now, even about knowledge about fascia, even about the, the innervation of this tissue, because everything changes when we come out with the first article about the innervation of fascia. So as soon as we prove that the fascia is a very well innervated tissue, I mean, of course, the, the value of fascia changed completely because it became a tissue that have a key you know, key role in perception, in proprioception. In fact, we say that the fascia is the organ for proprioception. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong, fascia can become a pain generator. Would you say that, uh, I'm curious, um, would you say that there's been a, this has been sort of my perception, there's been a bit of a, a shift in emphasis over the last several years of looking at that, that role of, of neurological innervation of fascia, as opposed to some of our former models that we were mechanically pulling, stretching, or, or manipulating, would you say that there's been a sort of a, a shift of attention looking a lot more at, the, at some of these neurological components here as well? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I mean, fascia is there since ever. I mean, we have a, in Padova, we have an atlas of anatomy that uh, explain the rule of fascia it, we're talking about 17th century, okay? So, I mean, we know the, quite well the biomechanical rule of fascia. So we know that the more than 30% of muscle fiber merge into the fascia. So we know that the gluteus max merge with the 80% of muscle fiber in the fascia lata. The same the deltoid, for instance. So we know that without have a clear understanding of the human fascia system, you are losing at the least one third of your biomechanics. So without no fascia system, you, you cannot know more than 60% of your biomechanics. So this is, you know, is not tolerable for anybody that was working with the human body. But that was the first step. The second step is really the innervation. So fascia is way more innervated than tendon and ligament. So we know, even from our perspective that uh, now everybody say like, watch out before to talk about tendinitis, because a lot of time there is no inflammation over there. My is the paratenon, so the sheet of the tendon that is altered. And that is what is inside the fascia system because the tendon sheet is a, a bilamination of the deep fascia. So it's from there that the pain is coming. So you can have tendinosis, degeneration of the tendon, or they say that you can have tendinopathy that nobody know what is, but normally is a para tendinopathy, so alteration of the paratenon. So this is this big shift is moving the attention from the tendon to the paratenon, okay, from the ligament to the surrounding structure. It, honestly, when you do a dissection, other than few particular ligaments like uh, you know the cruised ligament and so on. 
I will, you know, bet that not so many people will be able to recognize that clear ligament because a lot of time it's just a fascia reinforcement. Mm -hmm. That over time, the anatomists have uh, isolated, clean up to represent in the atlas. But if you do a dissection, don't believe that you will see a beautiful muscle along without anything around. You will not see like a ligament without anything around. I mean, when you do a real dissection, you will say that the anatomy is not more complicated. It's more sophisticated than what it looks like. But this sophistication allows us to do amazing motion that the robots are far away from what we are doing. So we, we are not able to build up robots that are so that are able to do the motion that we are doing because, because we are far away to understand our biomechanics related to all this system that I'm talking about, muscle spindle, Golgi organ corpuscle, fascia, okay? So there is a, a all neurological control we call like a peripheral coordination of the motion related to the fascia, muscle spindle, Golgi organ corpuscle that allow you to make a amazing coordination of the motion with the, all the motor units that we have in different muscle. You make some, you've made some interesting points about if fascia is the organ of perception, and you've been saying that, and you mentioned your early paper that showed innervation, and then other people have been saying that, Robert Schleip for years, for example. You made some interesting points that the superficial fascia's location of being far from the bones gives it a special advantage in a being a perceptor, in a location for the mechanoreceptors. Did I get that right? All right, good question. So we normally say that we have like a superficial fascia, deep fascia, visceral fascia. Okay, superficial fascia is within the hypoderma, okay, the subcutis, so in the middle of the fat, basically. Superficial fascia is way more innervated than the deep fascia. Why is that? Because the superficial fascia have Bassini, Ruffini, Corpasso, Meissner, Merkel, they have like everything that is needed for esteroception. So perception of what coming from outside, pressure, you know, cooling, yep. humidity, and, and so on. Mm. So the superficial fascia is very rich in autonomic free and nerves, okay? And some uh, mechanical free and nerves. So superficial fascia will be very important when you talk about um, allodynia, hyperalgesia, when you talk about the lymphedema, when you're talking about uh, painful cellulitis, when you talk about uh, like eczema, like alteration of like even uh, uh, hyperhidrosis or dry skin. So that is like uh, the rule of uh, skin with superficial fascia. Right below the superficial fascia, you have a very important sliding layer. So if you try to glide your skin, that glide is mostly permitted because there is an area of, gl of gliding between superficial deep fascia. So deep fascia, when you do pinch and roll, when you glide the skin, you don't affect the deep fascia at all. When you move the finger, the skin doesn't move, but the deep fascia move. So there is, the really border is between superficial deep fascia. So deep fascia is related to mechanics, to muscle traction, to tendon traction. And so that gives you information about how you move in the space. Superficial fascia perceive information from outside. So esteroception, so pressure, pulling, compression, temperature, humidity, everything that comes from outside. So, I mean, they have the same name, but they have completely different function. And so you have to understand what is the dysfunction of the patient, because the way that you are going to approach with manual therapy will be completely different. So we publish an article about this because, uh, I mean, everybody's doing amazing. Everybody believe it to do amazing stuff with their hand. But before you have to understand what is the problem, at which level I have to go, what is the target of my treatment, from where is coming from the problem. And sometimes there is a combination of two, superficial and deep fascia as well. On top of that, visceral fascia as well, that we don't have to forget. So this is where we are making research, most of research, where we are giving our contribution for a clinician. 
Because uh, again, you can do amazing with your hand, but you have to know where to put your hands properly. That's so, great. That's that kind of specificity is what really caught my eye in your in the first of you know part of your work that I was exposed to. You're making an important distinction between what the superficial fascia perceives and then the layer just underneath it, the deep fascia around the muscles. And you're saying that is more related to proprioceptive function with the superficial being or extraceptive. I got to say, it's it's really uh, it's stimulating and reassuring to hear that kind of distinction in this field, which is all about connection and uh, fascia itself, which is so sometimes undifferentiated or so continuous to have you make these kind of clear distinctions is, is really uh, mentally stimulating for me. So thank you for that. What about the mechanical properties of fascia and pain? This is, a, this is something that I've wanted to hear your views on, more about your views on this. You've spoken about densification and the way that fascia's mechanical properties can be part of the pain generation process. Can you give us some of uh, background on that? Right. I mean, that is like a, the core of our research uh, and where we started. So we know pretty well that the, the fascia is like, a, you can say like a flat tendon. But it's just it's the flat tendon is a multiple layer structure. So imagine to have like a three socks along all your leg, three so three long gloves along your upper limb. Because I have to open a parenthesis, like in the limbs we call like a ponevratic deep fascia. In the trunk we call epimesial deep fascia. Like okay. why is that? Because in the limbs, you have a long gloves and a long socks. In reality, it's three, one over the other, like three socks and three long gloves. In the trunk, you have like a sandwich. Each muscle is surrounded and completely attached with two layers of fascia, again, in three different depths, upper, middle, deep. So going the in the periphery, I mean, the fascia is a highway that allows you to transmit the force from the core to the periphery and vice versa, to bypass the joint. So in this way, you can get much more power in the extremity, decreasing the stress in the intermediate joints. So for instance, in the knee, you have a huge load that will come from the glutes, the tensofascial lata, okay? The glute is medium. So a lot of tension from the, this big muscle will be transmitted like a tube down to the knee. It will bypass, it will continue from fascia lata to crural fascia because there is no border, okay? So uh, please keep in mind that what you see in the atlas is a simplification. When you do a real dissection, you will not see the IT band at all. IT band is an artifact. IT band is a, a longitudinal cut of the fascia lata in the thicker area on the lateral side. You will never ever see an IT band in a real dissection until you don't cut, okay? So you will transmit the force, but what is the problem? The for each single layer, and we consider like a three layer, they transmit the force in a different direction, okay? That is quite related to the three plane of motion, more sagittal, more frontal, more horizontal motion. So the three layer has to be independent. It has to be independent to glide in relation to underlying muscle. So what you have between the three layer? What we call loose connected tissue. So we have adipose cell, glycosaminoglycans, and hyaluronan. So you basically you have that uh, lubricant that uh, you really need to create an independency. So if you have this independency, you know, each layer can pull in a different direction. It can connect synergic muscle in different body segment to allow you to make a, a motion very harmonic because you, you bypass the joint and you help to coordinate through the muscle spindle, different motor unit that work in synergy in different body parts. But if this lubricant become viscous, like a glue, of course, there will be more stiffness. It is a double problem. You have a lack of load transmission, but you can get an exceed tension. 
So all the mechanical receptor in that line of tension will be irritated. And so you will have a, like a, a peripheral sensitization that is uh, what we know clearly is the typical spreading pain that you have that, uh, why not? Majority of the time, uh, the patient perceive like a sciatic type pain, but that sciatic type pain have nothing to do with the sciatic nerve. Sciatic nerve just carry on, uh, carry up. The, the, the hyperalgesia, like the irritation of the free and nerves inside the fascia that is stiff, and so is over compressing the receptor right there. It's for this reason that you have a static pain more lateral, more posterior, more anterior, because, because in relation where you have a lack of gliding, you have an increase of the stiffness, decrease of range of motion, pain, and also why not? Also decrease of proprioception and lack of force because you are not able to recruit the muscle down there. So this is where we have introduced the concept of densification. So it's more dense, okay? It's not a lubricant, become more dense. And so if you put like a between like a three piece of paper, instead of put like a nice oil, you put honey, the three piece of paper, they seems very rigid. But the three piece of paper are the same is the interface change. So for this reason, when a, a manual therapist put a hand over a body, say, oh my gosh, you feel like stiff, like a piece of wood. But then the MRI doesn't show up anything. So worldwide, there is this uh, in conflict because you say, look, there is like a, a fibrosis sometimes you say, and then no one is able to prove because again, the densification can be so severe that there, it seems to be a fibrosis. But watch out. I really recommend to everybody, you have to do a clear distinct, a distinction between fibrosis and densification. They, they feel the same, but fibrosis is an exceed amount of a connected tissue, cause type one, type three, that you clearly see with the MRI, with the ultrasound, is a dramatic event. You need a trauma, surgery, infection, burning lesion, long immobilization, like in spasticity. And I imagine it's more uh, chronicity, the more time involved in the-, in the Right, right, flight, like flight. a long, okay. long-term mobility. Yeah. Densification can occur overnight, can occur right after a small trauma. But lucky for us, it can be resolved very fast as well. So that will make the big change when the people will be able to make a distinction because otherwise there will be very conf a lot of conflict with the radiologist and clinician because everybody feel and perceives different stuff. So the way we can tell the difference is how quickly it responds. Is that the main indicator of the difference between densification uh, and fibrosity? Um, at the end of the day, yes, that you, you can have like a past treatment, you know, diagnosis. Because uh, you cannot change a fibrosis, uh, you know, in in a, in a second or in, yeah. in a session. And you said they feel the same from a clinical point of view. If you, I mean, fibrosis is more severe. But uh, if you have a really chronic patient, this situation can be so bad that they really stuck the gliding. And you can, I mean, it would be not possible to distinguish one from the other. So mm. I, I want to say that if it's a, a severe densification, I will bet that the people from outside is not able to distinguish other than a treatment, after the treatment. Okay, so how does manual therapy affect that lubrication quality? Never mind the fibrosity for a second, but that sliding and gliding, what's going on with the mechanism there, in your opinion? Okay, so that is a good question. That is where we are doing research. I will be happy to share, I mean, eventually some data about that. Um, so we call it densification because basically the hyaluronan or hyaluronic acid, whatever you want to call, it can aggregate. If aggregate doesn't bound any more water. So you start to have like a, a sponge, imagine a sponge with a large hole and with like a thick septa versus a sponge with a very small hole in very tiny septa. So which sponge do you prefer to use? The, the one with small hole. 
So the normal extracellular matrix is a sponge with a small hole. A lot of, it can carry on, it can hold a lot of water. The sponge with a big hole and big septa, it seems, I mean, is the weight is the same, but this one will not able to carry the water. Does it make sense? Because the hole, so this sponge will become more, uh, you know, rough, more rigid. So imagine to have that kind of a sponge, like a lubricant, between the interface. So what you can do, Up, we are lucky because we have a different option. So heat modality and friction can uh, separate, can break this scepter, can uh, separate the exchange of hyaluronan, and so you can decrease uh, like disaggregation and restore the quality of the lubrification. But I want to underline that this can be done even with heat modality, because we know worldwide, people say, look, the, the doctor told me that I'm inflamed, but I, instead to put ice, I have a, like a hot shower, I feel better. I put a hot package, I feel better. So of course it's not an inflammation because if you are inflamed, heat will not get better, will make worse. So whenever the patient say, look, you know, the weather change, my knee hurts, that is myofascial pain. Because, because the halurana is temperature sensitive. So if you have a drop of the temperature, it becomes more stiff, it irritates more the receptor. So you have a allodynia from there. So you can make diagnosis since the beginning. Patients say, look, you feel better with the heat or with the cold, with heat. All right, this is myofascial pain. What about the weather? If the weather change, how you feel? I saw bad my neck, it hurts, it's terrible. That is myofascial pain. I have nothing to do with arthritis or arthrosis, okay? So that is the way to go. But unfortunately, heat modality doesn't last. So if you heat, you decrease the viscosity, but this the exceed of incorrect quality of hyaluronan can re-aggregate in a few hours, few days, you're like before. So for this reason, you need a friction, a manipulation. It is able not just to separate the change of hyaluronan, but is able to cut the in fragment that can be washed out because hyaluronan is very long protein. So if you cut in fragment, it can be washed out. And then specific cell that we have discovered in Padova, the fascia sites, they can produce new hyaluronan, the correct one. And so you really fix the problem because you restore the normal physiology in this area. And uh, last year, we have published an article and we have proved for the first time ever that with manual therapy, we can do this. Because in NYU, we have found out a new MRI, the T1 row, that is able to qualify or quantify the type of hyaluronan between the fascia. And it was amazing because we got the cover of the journal because it was the first time ever that the manual therapy was proved that manual therapy changed the biology of the tissue. That was, a, in my opinion, was, I mean, a big step for us. Yeah, I've got a question too, if we can go back for a moment to your discussion of the discrepancy between the superficial and deep fascia and what you're talking about here in terms of the, the manual therapy effects. Would you suggest or say that the, there's really different manual therapy strategies that you would use like technique wise, if you're aiming to have more of an impact on superficial fascia versus deep? It has to be. Mm -hmm. It has to be because the quality of the tissue is different, the depth is different, and the pathology is different. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the more important message is this. You have to adapt the treatment to the target that you are addressing. So if you have a clear diagnosis, you have a clear treatment, a clear result. If you have a clear diagnosis, your treatment will be, you know, random or not specific, and you're not hope to have a specific result. So this is a very important message I want to, you know, explain. It, I have to say that it's not as difficult. I mean, we are published article to explain what does superficial fascia, what does deep fascia. 
So they have a, a very different uh, rule in our body. And uh, even embryologically, the evolution of one fascia the deep from the superficial is different. So they're really different tissue. They have the same name, but they're really different tissue with different rule in our body. So adjusting manuality is uh, the, the way to go to get better and faster results. And so how would you characterize, just to follow through on Whitney's question, how would you characterize the different approach for the different layering if you wanted to affect the superficial fascia, for example, to uh, compared to affecting a deeper fascia? I mean, deep fascia, you have to go through all the adipose tissue. So the aim is to have like a rather small surface and you have to get to this surface of the muscle. So when you feel the surface of the muscle, it means that you already manipulate the deep fascia, okay? But you, don't, you cannot have a large surface because if you have a large surface, you will not be able to go through the adipose tissue. Does it make sense? You know? mm -hmm. So that is already step one, okay? Step two is that the deep fascia is really uh, made by collagen fiber. So you will feel like a rough surface when the layer doesn't glide, you feel like a rough surface, like a crunching surface. Because, because the layer doesn't move. So you really feel, you can perceive the collagen fiber. If someone can start to palpate the, the flexor retinacle of the wrist, it will feel like a crack, crack sensation. That is really the collagen fiber. So, I mean, it, it, it's a tissue that you identify, you feel, and you understand when it gets better. Because at the beginning, it will be rough, rigid, rooted, and then over time it becomes soft, nice, with a nice smooth uh, gliding. So you know when it's pathological, and you know when it gets better. And we have proved with student, we did a, like an interability, a interability test, and if you explain once what is a, 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 a densification, the student are able to repeat it properly with a currency, of 0 0.7, no, 0 0.84 as a mean value. That is really high in manual therapy. And we know manual therapy, the inter the interoperability is very low. And that is like a, the major problem manual therapy. Well, I don't always feel the same thing the next time I go back and feel something or if somebody else feels what I just felt, they may not always feel the same kind of thing. That's what yeah. you're talking about. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, that is the, like a delimitation sometimes of manual therapy. Mm. But if you explain where to go, because uh, we normally teach a map where there's the more critical area that has to be assessed. Because in our body, not all the areas are the same. There are areas where the gliding has to be preserved. So our key area for biomechanics, areas that are less important. So for this reason, if you have surgery, a scar in a specific area, you know for sure that it will generate problem, biomechanical problem. Scar in other area will not. On the same, if you have a scar that doesn't reach the deep fascia, you really don't care. If you do a quadrantectomy in the breast and you don't get to the deep fascia, you will never have any musculoskeletal problem. If you have a biopsy of a lymph node, that can generate the biomechanical problem because you reach the deep fascia can have adhesion, okay, between layer. So that is, is another point to understand the, the depth. The depth make the difference. Uh, you're talking about superficial fascia. Superficial fascia, you will see like the, the rigidity of the honeycomb of the skin septa in the superficial fascia that become rigid. So you need like a wider surface to try to make it more homogeneous, more adaptable, all this honeycomb of connective tissue that generated the level of fat. So, I mean, the manual is completely different. Superficial fascia can have a large surface. Sometimes you work like one hand against the other, like a knuckle against knuckle to try to manipulate the tissue. So, I mean, it's really a different way to go. I mean, it is it, a different tissue, the manuality, one and the other, they have really nothing to do one with the other. I mean, we, we normally explain that uh, how to do one or how to do the other. It, of course, that is related to the diagnosis as well that you do. 
Uh, I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm curious about uh, one of the arguments that is frequently brought up about, you know, what we're actually doing with our hands to these tissues. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. If the superficial fascia glides so easily over the top of the deep fascia, how do we impact or affect that deeper fascia with what we're doing with, with manual therapy if that tissue is just gliding over the deeper tissues so easily? You're talking about the frictionless interface argument. Yeah, often the, described as the frictionless interface. If yeah. there's no friction there, how do we get a hold of deeper structures or affect them at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not difficult because, again, the deep fascia doesn't move because the deep fascia have a, we call myofascial expansion. The deep fascia have multiple connection with the muscle. The muscle have a basal tone, so the fascia have a basal tone. So when you, you do surgery, you cut the deep fascia, deep fascia go away. And then when it's time to do a suture, you have to pick up the fascia, pull together and make the suture. So for this reason, when you go deep with your knuckle or with your elbow, you go there, the fascia stay there, doesn't move. And you are able to make friction over there. Of the opposite, the superficial fascia move. And for this reason, you have to use maybe knuckle against knuckle to treat, okay? Or squeeze with two finger as pinch and roll because otherwise they move away. You need to trap the superficial fascia between two things while you can work directly on the surface of the deep fascia, you're saying. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you've, you've done some really interesting studies around imaging these processes as well, both through ultrasound. And then you mentioned your recent research on getting imagery of the actual lubricity of the tissues. Right. We, at this time, we use like a dynamic ultrasound to see the gliding before and after. We use something that's called elastosonography that evaluate the stiffness of the tissue with the ultrasound. But now in NYU, we use an MRI, the name is T1 row, that is able to understand the quality of the loose quantity tissue. So if it's, a, we call it bound or unbound. So if it's self-aggregated or bound with the water, that is really explain the physiology of the tissue, the physiology of the, the lubricant, the interface. So that is a really two step forward than what we were used to do. The other uh, thought that's tossed around a lot is, is the idea of separating a pain phenomena from the physical qualities of the tissue. And probably, I know in uh, my own thinking, that relationship has loosened, where I don't always assume something painful has a physical manifestation, let's say. You are right. And this is like a, the key element, because at, nowadays, everybody believe that where is the pain is the problem. But unfortunately, it's not. Because where is the pain is where there is a, a high concentration of receptor, a, an incorrect uh, stimulation of the receptor. So first of all, I mean, if you cut the nails, doesn't hurt. If you cut the fingertips, it hurts a lot. Because this is not innervated, this is innervated. OK, this is already a step. But the second step is that the, over the joint, you have a hundred of vector discharge there. If any of these vector are pulling incorrect, you will stretch the capsule or the cap or whatever, and you will feel the pain in the shoulder, okay? So when you have a, you know, a tear of the supraspinatus, a tear of the capsule or the cap, it's just a sign that it is a poor biomechanics but doesn't tell you what is wrong because you have to take in consideration all the single vector to go there. If one of these vectors doesn't pull properly, there is an incorrect uh, mechanics in the shoulder. It, of course, the sora spinatus, that is the most, you know, the ag in the ugly position will be, you know, irritated, will be, you know, compressed, it will, it will tear. So the same you can explain to the knee. We know that uh, with total knee replacement, they take off like cartilage, bone, menisc, capsule, ligament. It 20% of the people they are still in pain worldwide because, because the pulley on the fascia right there is still there. Okay, so you know for sure this patient they need a treatment. Again, 
there is all the fascia lata discharge there. And the fascia lata is a tissue that you are not able to break. Trust me, when I do the section course, I, I give a sample fascia clap between two cocker to the participant and ask them to pull longitudinal and transversal. This is, a piece, this is a piece of cadaver fascia right. that you ask people to try to pull apart. Right, yeah. a piece uh -huh. of cadaver. Uh, longitudinal, nobody worldwide were never able to break. Never. Transversal, it gives you a hard time, but then you can break. Just to let you know how strong is this tissue. We are talking about something that in, in our laboratory of biomechanics, the machine is not able to break the sample fascia. At this time, there was no, with classical machine, you're not able to break the sample fascia. It's so resistant and it's not able to break. Because I have to carry, I mean, something that is more than 30, 40 kilograms because they, our machine worked for until that level because uh, they, they study a small sample. So just to let you know how much load the fascia is able to carry. I think about it as a tube that go all around the leg, okay? The time for that is removed. So a lot of picture of anatomy they don't represent, but when you do a dissection, you will clearly see and you can feel what exactly is the tissue, what, what is the rule of that tissue. So your work has uh, inspired in my thinking, a model that goes from let's, let's uh, focus less on trying to change the fascial length, which was my original training as a rolfer, to let's think more about the glide and lubricity and the relationship between different fascial layers. As I understand it, your, uh, your thinking is that pain is a result of that mechanical stimulation on the nerve endings, maybe from a denser or more crowded situation locally or histologically, maybe from forces being transmitted to that area. Is that more or less correct? It's correct. It this can explain also the referring pain. Because nowadays, referring pain, like spreading pain, is really hard to explain. Mm. Because every patient has a different referring pain. A lot of time, the referring pain bypass the board of the muscle. It doesn't match, doesn't match the dermatomerous. So how you can explain that? How you can explain that even over time, the same patient have a different radiation? Because, because this stiffness can modify during the time. So you can have a spreading pain more posteriorly and then a spreading pain more anteriorly because you have work posteriorly. Think about like a, a tissue, like your t-shirt. If you put together your t-shirt and your shirt and you walk, you will join the line of force. And along all this line of force, you will irritate the mechanical receptor. So you have a painful perception, not where the stock, because where the stock, you don't even stimulate the mechanical receptor you overstimulate where there is line of force. And if you make another addition far away, you have such a huge line of force that will generate like a sharpening pain, like you always see in a, maybe sciatic, that a lot of time you have a densification in the calf, densification in the glutes on the pubic region. And so you have a really tight line of force that will mimate like a, I mean, the nerve, my reality is that the free ending nerves that are irritated, that are carried on by the nerves, but the nerves have nothing to do until you don't have a lack of force. Okay, anesthesia this is another story. Okay, but if it, the, the, velocity of, the velocity of transmission of, of the nerves is preserved, pain, severity of the pain, it doesn't mean severity of the pathology. Because myofascial pain can generate the terrifying, like a very acute, very debilitating pain, but the MRI will be negative. So, I mean, I'm not scared about pain because you can manage, you can deal patients that are really in agony. You can make a miracle because myofascial pain can be really severe. And lucky for us, with our hand, we can make diagnosis and treatment at the same time. That is amazing. Mm. Well, I mean, a lot of us have experienced that with our manual therapy, and I know in your method as well, you've studied that carefully. Here's the question that I wanted to ask you when I was in Berlin, I think it was 2018, and you kindly sent me some references. The question I wanted to ask you, have, have you or do you know of other research that 
correlates the local density of the tissue with pain phenomenon itself. You've done some really careful work on being able to change the density and the way manual therapy does that. Do we know that pain is the result of density or the result of mechanical pressure? Has that been tested? Um, we have like a, um, I would like to introduce like a Elena Langevin, that is the director Langevin. of the complementary medicine in, uh, in NIH. Yeah. So Langevin have published an article that they explained that uh, it were in pig, it was in human. Uh, human with low back pain, the toroidal fascia is 25% thicker and 59% with less sharing, mm -hmm. less gliding. Yeah. If you take a look at our study about neck pain, yeah. the fascia in people with chronic pain, the fascia is thicker and there is more black, more space between layer. If you take a look at the study of a Siddhartha, Siddhartha about trigger point, but all the study about the trigger point. Trigger point is a stiff area, more hypoechogenic. What do you mean hypoechogenic? With more fluid, more black. Yeah. yeah. So how, what is this fluid in the trigger point? What is the fluid that generates the trigger point? Let me see, it's let me catch up. I'm sorry, Dr. Stock, let me just catch up. So your Langevin study showed the denser and less gliding fascia in the lumbar, thoracolumbar fascia of subjects with back pain. Your study of neck uh, fascia showed thicker uh, fascia of the cervical fascia, I believe it was, or SCM fascia in people with pain. And then you're also saying there's more fluid in the trigger point zones. Okay, so is that correlation or cause? This is, all right, this is a correlation because the trigger point at the end of the day, that black, it yeah. can be aggregate hyaluronan. That is a fluid but it's uh -huh. way more viscous than the surrounding area. Yeah. So everybody's looking from different perspective, the same manifestation because toracolumbar fascia is more stiff, trigger point is more stiff. Yeah. Toracolumbar fascia is more is thicker, the cervical fascia is more thicker. The cervical fascia have more black in the middle. The trigger point is, is a black hole. Okay. So you see, everybody's finding the same result from different perspective. What I can say that I never checked the muscle in the cervical area, but it could be that in the middle was more black. The guys from a, from a Siddhartha, from the trigger point group, they didn't check the fascia, but from my eyes, that fascia was not normal. So the, the possibility is that at the beginning, it started with the, a small densification inside the muscle, the endomyosis. Mm. When you get to the deep fascia, the deep fascia starts to just spread in pain. It starts to affect the, the, the distal, the proximal part. So you start to generate the compensation. So you start to have a, like a low back, then you start to have a gluteus pain, upper back, because when the deep fascia becomes rigid, you have like a, a stiff highway that starts to generate compensation in different body segments. And so time after time, so to have other problem. And as we know, our patient get chronic. Yeah, you know, patient chronic have more symptom on and off in different parts of the body because fascia can do that. Well, okay. So how are you doing, Whitney? Anything you want to work into our conversation here? I got more questions, but I don't. Yeah, go ahead with what you're going to ask. I've got several questions. I imagine that are probably similar to what, what you were going to say. So, so go ahead with what you're going to ask. All right. So you're, you're, again, Dr. Seco, your model is elegant in its understanding of the local effects and then how larger effects within the structure could biomechanically predispose us to pain as well. Uh, some of your work has shown changes that you see three to six months after the manipulation, yeah, that you've seen on your imagery, or I believe it was, if I understood it, if I read it right, that some of your changes lasted. What's the mechanism of that lasting? Why does it persist, do you think? Okay, there's two major reasons. All right. First reason, you do not have to just resolve the pain. It's not enough. You have to restore biomechanics. So the patient come with knee pain, uh, 
if you don't take care of the peri region, if you don't take care of the other side, uh, because I've walked incorrectly for months, this, you will not get this guy back to the track as it was. So you have to take care also the opposite side, even if the patient doesn't have symptom, but maybe just a decrease of range of motion. So again, it's not enough to treat the pain. Treat the pain is easy. Restore the biomechanics, the full biomechanics is another story. And you need a more, I say holistic, a more you know, wide vision of the patient. And this is the first major reason why we can get the long lasting result. And the second is that it's not enough to warm up the area. You have to manipulate the point to catalyze a specific inflammatory process that will last 48 hours, that will help, will, will keep our manipulation, it will restore the normal physiology. So in your because, method, you're doing that intentionally, as I understand. You're inducing an inflammatory reaction. Right. Yeah. Like shockwave can do the same. So mm -hmm. you need, I mean, if you warm up, you just decrease the viscosity. My, in that area, it will stay the same quantity and quality of uh, loose quantity tissue. It can uh, quickly re-aggregate. So you do like laser, infrared, whatever you want. And then the, the patient after a few days come back and say, look, you know, it was better, but now I like before. If you stimulate this inflammatory process, it's a very particular inflammatory process that it doesn't have to occur where the patient feels the pain. But in the critical area that we have mapped where the biomechanics is important, because again, the area of the symptom is not the region of the problem. The area of the symptom is where there is a, the discharging of incorrect factor. So if you restore the normal physiology in the, this center of coordination, this area where the motion, the final vector are generated, then you are able to give a long lasting result. But to restore the physiology, you have to wash out the incorrect quality and quantity of hyaluronan. So you have to cut down in fragment. Otherwise, this long change doesn't wash out. So the inflammatory process is able to call it what we call hyaluronic days. The enzyme is cut down in fragment, and then it can wash out. So this inflammatory process you can do like with the aggressively needling. If you needling quite aggressive, you will do shock wave, radial shock wave, uh, focal shock wave. You can do okay deep friction manipulation. You can do, but you cannot do with the a light laser, okay, a light uh, infrared, because uh, it's a heat modality that is not able really to give, uh, if it's a major densification, if it's a minor, it can, otherwise it's not. So that is the two major principle why we are able to give long lasting results. And you're, also, a certain amount of pressure is needed, you're thinking? The, the, the pressure you need to get to the surface of the muscle. So, I mean, in the face, you don't get so much pressure. I mean, if you have like a 10 centimeter of uh, adipose tissue, you will need more. But when you get to the surface, uh, you already make friction in the deep fascia. Deep fascia is above the muscle. So you know where you have to go. And back to what you were saying too a moment ago about uh, the restoration of biomechanics. What does that look like in terms of the therapeutic interventions? Or is this trying to get people to do particular movement patterns after we've done our physical tissue manipulation or what is it, what does that kind of look like? I mean, it's easy what that what look like. I mean, the, you know that uh, if there is stiffness in one side, uh, over time, uh, that will generate overuse. And so the opposite side will become stiff to compensate. So you have to work both the sides of the arm. If you have a low back pain and you are lumping, the other leg will work uh, overwork to carry on. And so if it's a couple of weeks, it's not a big, big problem. But if it's a couple of months, couple of years, you will have a lot of stiffness for overuse contralateral. So you just try to evaluate and we have a build up of what we call the human fascia system, the biomechanics of human fascia system. We have subdivided the body in three planes of motion, frontal, sagittal, horizontal. And we have identified which area are more related for motor unit that work for specific direction. 
So you basically, through this map that is a public available, they can download the app for free if they want. I mean, they can find out in Apple Store, in Google Plus, it's for free. You can see which point, which area work together. So if you find out there is a dysfunction in the frontal plane, you will want to take care of other point in that plane that work in the opposite side. In, in, in you check if you feel that they are stiff, you treat. If they are smooth and nicely, you just let the patient go. The final sensation has to be a sensation of lightness. So the patient has to feel the end of the treatment, maybe sore because I've treated, full range of motion, but the sensation of lightness. The head has to be light. The leg has to be light. Okay, because when it, the, 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 there is a tightness, you have a, a bombardment from the periphery. You feel like uh, someone is, uh, you know, is uh, pulling you down. If you release the tension, you have a sensation like a, a global lightness. So that is a, another sensation that will give you like a, the green light to, to let the patient go and, uh, in, I mean, know that uh, what you have done, I have restored the biomechanics properly. Yeah. So what what do you think uh, about the role of sensation? I mean, Robert Schleip tells the story of his informal studies of people being anesthetized with the hypothesis that our work would be less effective with them. What, so your explanations are physiological. What do you think about the role of sensation in the work? Would it work on somebody who's anesthetized? Um, I mean, there is a couple of articles that uh, I think are important. So the, in the ankle, where we have a little bit uh, information, because uh, we say that the retinacula, for instance, the upper of the ankle, are the key element of the fascial system for proprioception. So we focus there because it's really the, the king of the proprioception. So there is two studies that were done not from our group, from other group. So they tried to anesthetize with the lidocaine, the ligament, and the patient didn't lose the proprioception. Then they anesthetized the full foot. And then at that time, the patient lost the proprioception. So it's not the ligament, it's something else. Okay. That study cannot prove it is the retinacle, but we published other four articles in uh, athletes, soccer player, where we specifically treated the retinacula subject that have, were suffering of a functional ankle instability. And we proved that we were able to improve the stability and the performance, just working the retinacula. So retinacula are very easy to, to recognize because it's a thick area of the deep fascia. So with the ultrasound, with MRI, you can really see this retinacula. You can see the damage because they are so rigid that sometimes they really, you can tear the retinacula. It's the only element you can really tear after ankle sprain. Because are, a lot of people, they call ligament. Some atlas, they make a, a misunderstanding between ligament and retinacula. But the retinacula are extremely full of receptor, full of receptor. Ligament, almost zero, mm -hmm. okay? So they look the same at your eyes, but the innervation will be different. So again, innervation make the difference. Poor innervated, you don't really care much, Huge innervation, you care a lot. So the if you understand these eyes, I mean, this is like a, some some information that can be helpful to understand in the same location, like an ankle, what is doing what. Ligament is a passive element, just a mechanical stability. Retinacle give you the active stability. For instance, in the hip, majority of the stability is passive. You cannot subluxate the hip. Is it possible? The ankle, if you want, uh, with your hand, you can almost supersede the foot because the stability of the ankle is active. So who is making the stability? The muscle. Who is telling the muscle what to do? The brain. Who is telling to the brain what's going on there? The retinacula. That is the best element. It's like a wristband with some periosteum insertion, some muscle insertion like uh, extensor brevis, abductor polyps, and some tendon insertion because uh, all the tendon, they go through a bilamination of the retinacula. So retinacula feel bone, muscle, a tendon. is a tight wristband, is completely full of receptor. So there is nothing better than a retinacula to feel the movement in the joint, nothing better. 
In uh, we have a retinacle over the patella as well. Mm -hmm. We have the retinacle of the wrist. We have a retinacle of the elbow. So in the most critical joint, we need a retinacula. And so for this reason, we say that the retinacula are there because nature want to give us a three degree of freedom in the wrist without put with a, in a small space. So here you have eight bone plus a radio ulna plus a metac metacarpal. So this is a, a crazy joint, crazy. So, I mean, this is not the best that you can have. This is like a compromise to give you like a three degree of freedom is a narrow surface. And you don't want to make any subluxation. So you need a retinacula that is really tell you what's going on and try to adjust the tension of the muscle. And in the ankle, you have a three retinacula because you have a huge amount of load over there that has to be managed. So retinacula, you can, you can restore function, functional ankle stability. So worldwide, Functional ankle stability is still untreatable. If we say, look, we have proved that we have three to with nine months follow up with this patient. You can fix functional ankle stability. You just have to know where is the problem. Retinacle is the answer. Yeah. We'll put some links to your uh, work. You did some interesting work around imaging. I'm looking at the imaging of cruel fascia and epimesial fascia thickness in basketball players with previous ankle sprains. We'll make sure we get some good links into some of you thinking about retinacula as well. So we're back to the idea of fascia as a sensory organ of the fascist talking to the brain. And, and we, we began the conversation with you talking about your family legacy and how that really propelled you into this work. You've been at this for quite a while. You've been doing a, you know, a substantial body of research. I'm just curious what what has changed in your own thinking? What has been surprised you in your research? How do you think about things differently now than maybe when you did your research career? I mean, a uh, lot of changes after we understood the interface because we, we basically, we are quite robust in the, let's say the anatomy. So the layer of fascia, the collagen fiber, type one, type three, the three layer, how is the fashion the arms? How is the fashion the trunk? We are quite strong over there. But uh, the big step uh, after the innervation was to understand that what's exactly going on? What is the densification? So what is the process? And just uh, recently, I mean, with the article of last year, we understood that this kind of uh, uh, like a three-dimensional superstructure of hyaluronan. So this aggregation, that will generate like this sponge with a big hole instead to have a small hole. So this is brand new uh, information that the uh, MRI, this new MRI have uh, proved it. In and this is just to make it get clear for myself, you're talking about the actual tissue having a sponge-like structure, but also the aggregated molecules having a relationship like that. Like, yeah, yeah, sorry. So like the honeycomb is like the subcutis, like a, from the skin to spiritual fascia, we have this septa, that generate the level of fat, like the a honeycomb. tissue honeycomb, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of the superficial that. fascia between, but in reality, like a, a molecular level, so you cannot see with your eyes with microscope, a molecular level, the single change of hyaluronan can attach a generate like a sort of sponge, okay, yeah. that can have a big hole or small hole, okay. And this is quite brand new because if you have a small hole, it's a soft, smooth sponge, so a very nice lubricant. If you have a big hole, it's a very rigid, rough sponge that will generate like a, a glue. So this is something that we have uh, just discovered. And we have tried to use that also hyaluronic days in human, in US, like in John Hopkins, in NYU we are doing to decrease this viscosity in neurological patient, patient with spasticity. So this uh, extremely severe subject with a really major limitation of quite our life, uh, we inject the hyaluronic days, uh, and they restore range of motion, not just passive, but also active. This is seven year study that we have uh, performed in NYU, and now we have uh, moved uh, the study in John Hopkins. We are treating more than 200 uh, patients with spasticity, it, again, what is really surprised us that we are able to improve even active movements because 
before to get to fibrosis, it takes decades. So we have patients that are 15 years and they are not yet fibrosis in the muscle by just a, a dramatic full thickness densification. So we have a therapeutic window that in this patient that uh, can be, you know, can be used to avoid fibrosis and get improved quite a life. Fantastic. Oh, it's fascinating stuff. Anybody we want to ask Dr. Stecco while we have his attention? Yeah, I just think, uh, you know, it's, it's provides such such rich questions and things for us to think about. You know, what is the nature of what we're doing under our hands? And there's just, uh, I think, a lot of different things that seem that we're now learning maybe happening under there with, with those sensations that we feel. So it's 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 fascinating to to hear some more about you know what's going on in the laboratory looking into that. And to give us a more specific understanding about the layering, but then also what's happening perhaps at a molecular level mm -hmm. when we touch and we use pressure and the role change in that. Yeah. Dr. Seco, how can people learn more about you and your work? Um, well, they can go in uh, www.fashionmanipulation.com and then they can read a little bit. They can check it out, our, our article from there. Um, so that is the easy way to get uh, information. Of course, PubMed, there's a lot of articles that are also open source, so they, they can uh, take a look. But again, we have a lot of uh, books about theoretical part, about the physiology, the atlas of physiology, the atlas of anatomy of fascia. So, I mean, uh, in, they, they can have a, like a quite a robust material from where to start to understand anatomy, physiology, and biomechanics. That is the ABC to understand the, the fascia world. Uh, this is like at the beginning. Of course, they can move on then in the clinical part. And uh, I mean, they are welcome to, you know, get more information about how this information can be bring to the clinical part, to their office. We'll be sure to put that link in the show notes as well as a link to your FM app, et cetera, and some of those studies we've mentioned. Thank you for your time. Whitney, who's our closing sponsor for today? Yes, so today we're going to be uh, sponsored by Books of Discovery, and they have been a part of massage therapy education for over 20 years. Thousands of schools around the world teach with their textbooks, e-textbooks, and digital resources. And in these trying times, this beloved publisher is dedicated to helping educators with online friendly digital resources that make instruction easier and more effective in the classroom or virtually. Books of Discovery likes to say, learning adventures start here. They see that same spirit here on the Thinking Practitioner podcast, and they're proud to support our work, knowing we share the mission to bring the massage and Bible community enlivening content that advances our profession. Check out their collection of e-textbooks and digital learning resources for pathology, kinesiology, anatomy, and physiology at booksofdiscovery.com, where Thinking Practitioner listeners save 15% by entering Thinking at checkout. And we would like to say a thank you to all of our sponsors and also all to uh, all the listeners, the people who are hanging out with us here. Hope you've gotten some great uh, insights into fascial work with our discussions today. You can stop by our sites for handouts, show notes, transcripts, and any extras. You can find that off of my site at academyofclinicalmassage.com. And Till, where can people find that from yours? My site, advanced-trainings.com. We'll put this show in the show notes. We'll put links to Dr. Seco's site, et cetera. If there's questions or things you want to hear us uh, talk about, email us at info at thethinkingpractitioner.com or look for us on social media. Just my name, Till Luca. Whitney, yours? Uh, yes, today my name is Whitney Lowe. You can find me there as well. And uh, if you will also get a chance to rate us on Apple Podcasts, as it does help other people find the show and you can hear us on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you happen to listen. Please do share the word and tell a friend. And of course, if you're unable to find us in any of those locations, you can hear us on a bonus track on the greatest hits of the Humpback Whale songs as well. So thank you again, Dr. Stecco, for joining us today in this conversation. It was a wonderful, enlivening, uh, fascinating dive, deep dive in, into the world of, of some soft tissue topics that I think will be really fascinating to look into. Well, thanks for the invitation. And, uh, you know, it was great to have uh, spend this time with you, with you. So thanks a lot. All right. It's, it's an honor. Thanks much. Take yeah. care. Okay. Take care.